I just recorded 10 minutes of video with no video going. <laughs> how bright of me, how smart, how uh, typical. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Murphy. This is my channel, Murphy's Every Whim, where I talk about books because I love to talk about books. I also love to read books, but in November, I pretty much took a vacation, and that vacation was also a vacation from books. It was my 65th birthday month, so I celebrated the whole month, and it was my sister's 60th birthday month. We went on a two-week vacation together, which included multiple theme parks and a Caribbean cruise. And I also spent eight days on the road driving 3,800 miles. And what I found was while I was on the road, I listened to books. But while I was with my sister, I didn't read anything. On the cruise, there were people all over the boat reading. Everywhere I turned around, there was somebody reading, and I talked to some of them about what they were reading, and I might make a video about that sometime. But while we were in Orlando and on our cruise, I didn't read anything. <laughs> My sister said, you're taking a vacation, and that includes a vacation from what you do all the time, which is read books. So... My TBR for November was taken from this book. I chose 11 books out of this book, 500 Great Books by Women, by Erica Baumeister, Jesse Larson, and Holly Smith. I've read about 10% of the books listed in here, and I wanted to increase that. So I chose 11 books, but as I've said with the TBR, if I don't get to all the TBR, that's fine. I enjoy the selecting of the books, um, and I enjoy being still able to have some choice. Um, I ended up reading three books completely out of that list, started one book, and then I read one other, uh, not on the TBR, and started a sixth book. So I finished four books in November and uh, started two more. So let's talk about the books. The first book is Princess by Jean Sasson, and this is Princess, A True Story of Life Behind the Veil in Saudi Arabia. And this is ostensibly a biography, uh, but it's told in first person as if it's an autobiography. The woman that is telling the story is named Sultana, that's not the woman's real name. And she is a princess in Saudi Arabia. That means her father is one of the many, many, many sons of the first king of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia as a country is not that old. About uh, less than 100 years old. And the current king of Saudi Arabia, at least as far as I could tell, is a son of the first king of Saudi Arabia. So the story starts when Sultana is young, growing up in a household with her mother, father, and one brother, and uh, I think seven sisters. And her, her father has three other wives and three other families. Her brother is the firstborn son in the family and is cherished by her father, and uh, the girls are not. The boy and her father clearly have ability to travel, to do things without being chaperoned, and she does not, and on and on. I'm sure that uh, many people know what life is like for the well-to-do in Saudi Arabia. She also talks about the lives of her servants, and other people that she meets along the way. She talks about the life of women who must guard their virginity and what links some women go to, some girls go to, to be able to have a love life, a 
you know, experiences outside of what is preordained for them. She worked to try to get some things changed for women, and and a lot has changed since then. I was looking at what changes have been made, and even within the last few years, a lot of changes have been made in Saudi Arabia about the rights of women. But we also know that there are still some uh, civil liberties that are denied to servants and people who come to Saudi Arabia to work. The woman Sultana is in some ways a sympathetic character and I liked her, but it's, but it was often difficult to like her. Uh, in my upbringing, um, it was thought that a husband and wife would have a good relationship, that it wasn't good to fight. It wasn't good to have wars with your husband. And Sultana culture is completely different. Husband and wife are often antagonistic, often battling against each other. And especially in her case, in this story, she battled for ha being the sole wife of her husband. That was something that she fought for and fought hard for. And I was raised that, you know, if you had to fight that hard, it was time to leave the marriage. Uh, it was a powerful book. I'm sure when it came out, it was eye-opening. Uh, I worry a little bit about the veracity of the story, but it seemed to be praised by critics and fans alike. And there have been other books in the series telling more about Sultana's life. So that was Jean Sasson's Princess. And it's the first book in a series of books about Sultana. The next book I finished was Daddy Was a Number Runner. And this is by Louise Merriweather. And this was first published in 1970, it looks like. Sometimes it's hard to find the original publication date in a book when it's, you know, a reprint and there have been other printing since then, or maybe even in some cases other copyright renewal since then, but it looks like this was written in 1970. Daddy Was a Number Runner is a coming-of-age story. It's uh, the 12th and 13th year in the life of Francie, a young black girl growing up in Harlem during the Depression. Her father was a number runner, so he worked for the, you know, people running a covert gambling situation. So it was an illegal activity that her father was in. He wasn't always able to do this. He got in trouble with the people he worked with. So there were times when he didn't have work. And so her mother had to work as a housekeeper and had to travel a long ways to uh, where she was working. So she was gone a lot. And so Francie and the other girls that and boys that she grew up with were often on their own. They lived in areas where uh, kids that they knew had grown up and started tricking. So her one of her brothers actually became a pimp during the time of this book. Uh, there were others that were drinking too much, into drugs, that sort of thing. Her life was perilous in terms of being physically attacked by predators, both predators within the black community and white men who would come to this area in Harlem and prey on young women. Another group of people that preyed on young girls and women were shopkeepers who knew that they had some leverage because they could control how much the people coming in's money was worth in the store. They could give them privileges if the children allowed them to prey on them. It was heartbreaking. It was, I'm sure at the time that it came out in the 70s, very raw for some people. It's books like this that helped us learn what life is like on the other side, or an other side, I should say. 
uh, a powerful book. I haven't finished reading the uh, afterward, which goes into a lot about the history and uh, the context of the book, and I'm going to read that. This isn't a memoir or a biography, but it is based on the experiences of Louise Merriweather when she was growing up. So that's Daddy Was a Number Number Runner by Louise Meredith. Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons. And this was uh, very fun to read. It was a parody of books by Thomas Hardy and D.H. Lawrence. And as I said when I introduced the, my reading list, I haven't read any D.H. Lawrence, but I've read some Thomas Hardy. And, and this, this fit right in with being a parody of those sorts of works. Stella Givens tells the story of a 19-year-old woman, Flora Post, whose family has has all died and left her with a hundred dollars, a hundred pounds a year, which isn't enough to get a place to live and be independent. So she needs to go live with relatives, and so she finds relatives in various places in, in England and writes to them and ends up that the only family that would take her in, and they're taking her in out of some unknown obligation that she's unaware of, something the family owes her father. Um, and it's on a farm, cold comfort farm, in fact. Going to this farm was cold comfort for her. She found out she has has cousins who work the farm. Her great aunt, Aunt Ada Doom, is the matriarch, and she never comes out of her room except twice a year. Then there's the the aunt and her husband, and that aunt is clearly has a mental problem. She's isolated, but she comes in and does the cooking and but most of the time she just spends her time in her room and she is obsessed with one of her sons her youngest son there's the father amos and he is a hellfire preacher who um goes into town and preaches several times a week and he his message is um i can't save you you're going to hell I can just prepare you for going to hell. <laughs> uh, the Something that they do in the church is quiver. I'm not sure what that is. We didn't ever found out quite what that is. Um, then there's all the cousins and people who work on the farm, including a man in his 90s who keeps the cows who are... I can't remember all their names, but it's like aimless, feckless, four cows. And then there's a bull they never let out of the barn. Uh, the crops are doing poorly. They, they can't seem to complete the work on a well. Nothing seems to be working for them, and they're just going downhill. Everyone has some sort of, of obsession or mental problem. And 19-year-old Flora Post comes in, and she likes to tidy things up. <laughs> and so she works on tidying things up. Oh, yeah, there's also a a daughter of somebody who who's also one of the cousins and lives there. And she spends her time just wandering around in strange clothes, writing poetry. And so Flora Post, who sort of of high society, London comes in and tidies up the place. Something we find out is that Aunt Ada Dune won't let anybody leave the farm. And they leave the farm anyway, but they just do it on the sly. And one of the cousins really wants the farm and is afraid that Flora is come has come in to take it away from him. She convinces him that she's on his side and wants him to succeed. So she starts a campaign of helping each of these people obtain their lifelong desire. And 
well, I'll let you know. I'll let you read it to find out whether she's successful or not. Um, but it, it is, it's dark, but dark in a hilarious way. Cold Comfort Farm. I'd read it again. Uh, <laughs> just to, I'm sure I missed details. I'd read it again. It's that funny. And my sister devour, or started devouring it. She read while we were on the trip, but I didn't. <laughs> All right. So those are the books from my reading list that I finished. I also got started on My Brilliant Career by Miles Franklin, but I found this uh, difficult to read, and so I need to um, spend some more time on it. I think I need to start from the very beginning. This was written by a woman who used part of her name as the pseudonym Miles Franklin. She grew up in uh, the Australian outback. Her father made some bad decisions about business and ended up putting them in, you know, in a bad financial situation. And then Australia had the outback where they were had drought. And so there were problems everybody had. And that's as far as I've gotten uh, in the book. And I do want to, I do want to read it, but it's just the language is difficult. The knowing what everything means is difficult. How Miles Franklin wrote this is, uh, I mean, she was young. She was 15 or 16 when she wrote the book. It's clearly written by someone who's young. I'll, I'll try to finish this sometime. I often listen to the great courses. You can usually get them for free uh, if you have Audible Plus. I've listened to many of them, and it's a mixed bag whether they're good or not. And this one ended up being good. It is The Life and Times of Prince Albert uh, from the Great Courses, and it was uh, the lectures were written and read by Patrick Ollett. And when I say that it's hit and miss, some of the lecturers in the great courses are good at lecturing, the actual speaking, the actual presenting of the material. And Alet is good. Uh, he said he'd done several other great courses, and so I'm going to look them up. He's a historian, so it focuses on Prince Albert and his education, his upbringing, how he got connected with Victoria, some things about her life up in that point, their marriage, their children, uh, what he contributed to Great Britain, what his relationship was with her, the things that he contributed to the monarchy, for instance. He's the one who helped design and build Balmoral. So it focused on him. Uh, one reason I wanted to read this was I recently read a fiction book that where Prince Albert was being protected by a detective because Prince Albert's life was at risk for specific reasons. And so one reason I wanted to read this was that I wanted to sort of fill in the gaps of why was Prince Albert in that situation at the time. But another is that, you know, once, you, once you've read, you know, so many nonfiction books on a particular era or a particular person, it's nice to start working around the edges. And so I didn't want another book about Queen Victoria, and so I chose this. I thought it was good. The lectures were divided out into, and this is one of the advantages of uh, the great courses, is each lecture is somewhat self-contained, uh, and they have a theme, and Alet was very good at making these themes. The So it wasn't told in a chronological way, but more uh, this aspect of Prince Albert's life and this aspect. It was interesting to read more about the other characters at play during the Victorian era, but I think I needed to brush up a little on who they were. This is one of the great courses that I would recommend, The Life and Times of Prince Albert. 
The last book that I started and got uh, about a third of the way through, and I'm very interested in finishing this up, was The Elegance of the Hedgehog by Muriel Marbury. And I didn't know what to expect with The Elegance of the Hedgehog. So recently I have talked about A Gentleman in Moscow, and uh, it's by Immortals. And everybody I talk to loves this book, and my sister keeps begging me to find some other book that is comparable to that. And I had a feeling that The Elegance of the Hedgehog might be that. It's not, but that's okay for me. In, in some ways, The Elegance of the Hedgehog reminds me of Madeline's Rescue, a book I read as a kid, you know, set in France, the story of children, that it has that flavor to it, because there is a 12-year-old girl in this book, and she's getting ready to turn 13, and it's no secret, this is mentioned at the beginning, she plans to uh, commit suicide on her 13th birthday. And part of the reason she wants to do that is she wants her parents to start paying attention to things. So is this really just preteen angst, or is this something that this girl is serious about? Not sure. The girl's name is Paloma. Paloma lives in a an apartment building with a concierge, and the con the most of the story is told from the concierge point of view in first person, and parts of it are still told in Paloma first person. The concierge is a widow. She's very intelligent, very well read, she, but she grew up in poor circumstances. And so the class system that, as she perceives it, keeps her from letting anyone else in the building know that she's anything other than just the stereotypical dull concierge that sits in her room, pets her cat, and watches TV all the time. So she actually runs the TV all the time, so people think that's what she's doing. And yet she's read philosophy and history and fiction and, and watched art movies and gone to museums and listens to classical music, um, but she can't let anybody know that. Paloma is precocious. She knows, she is intelligent beyond her years, and she has to hide that from people. And so we get to know some of the other people in the apartment building. I believe there are eight apartments, and some of them are 4,000 square feet. Some of them are 2,000 square feet, and the concierge's space is 800 square feet, which, you know, is a decent-sized apartment, but um, definitely puts her in a different class than everybody else. And so she continues, the concierge continues to hide her life from everybody else. Paloma hides her life from everybody, and we learn about her sister and her parents and what they are like, and all of a sudden, a new man moves into the apartment building, and he starts pulling Paloma and the concierge out of their skin, out of their, where they've been hiding all this time. He starts pulling them out, and that's where I am, and I I I really can't wait to find out what happens. There are long, long passages in uh, The Elegance of the Hedgehog about philosophy and movies and books and life, and it's much more philosophical and esoteric than 
maybe people would want this book to be. But I'm enjoying that aspect of it too, because that's telling me so much about both Paloma and the Concierge. The Elegance of the Hedgehog by Muriel Marbury. Those are the books I've read. Four complete, two partials. That's all I read in, in November. And I'm still sick. I'm still, I have um, an ear infection behind the eardrum, ear infection, and still clogged up with all sorts of congestion. My throat is sore. And I haven't felt like reading since I've gotten home either. But I have been working on um, some French. So I'm, I'm reading a children's book in French. And so I do some translation every day. But uh, other than that, I spend most of my time sleeping and editing videos because I find editing videos something I can do without much mental effort. So not as quite as cheery <laughs> and upbeat a video as some of my ones uh, from recently, but hopefully I'll, I'll start feeling better soon. I'll start reading some more and until then, take care.